Dr. Ara Duke Majin, CEO and founder of Duke Spine Institute. It is April 1st, and it is, we are not joking, we are doing surgery today. We're in the middle of a pandemic for coronavirus because it's April 1st, 2020. And I may give you some of my thoughts about the coronavirus, but first, for those of you here to watch spine surgery, I'll just tell you that we are performing surgery still, but not on most of our patients. We've had to cancel about 80% of our surgeries and cases because they were not urgent. Um, the patients that I'm doing surgery on today have pinched nerves with nerve damage. And the nerve damage will just get worse if they are not treated. So neurosurgical procedures for nerve damage or brain damage or spinal cord damage are considered urgent to emergent. That's why we're proceeding with these surgeries today. Um, that being said, our patient here has a pinched nerve on the right side at L45. Now, this pinching is due to a couple of different things, which you're going to be able to see on the x-ray once I get the x-ray picture shown to you. But let me talk to her first before we get started. Okay, dear Dr. Duke here, all right? We're gonna get started. I'm gonna start by numbing up your back where I'm gonna go in and do the surgery with some, some numbing medicine, some Novocaine and lidocaine, basically some Marcaine and lidocaine mixture, okay? It's gonna sting a little bit going in. I can't do anything about that, okay? That's my hand on your back, all right? I'm just gonna feel around a little bit for your iliac crest so I know where to go. Now you're gonna feel a little stick and burn, all right? Don't be upset about it. It'll just last for a second or two. Now, <coughs> if you feel uh, any pain during the surgery, for any reason, just say ouch, okay? If you say ouch, that tells me that I need to do something a little different and help you give you a little bit more medicine or something, all right? So just say ouch, but don't try to move your body. Once you move your body around, then I have to change the x-ray again, which means we gotta take more pictures. We don't wanna do that, we wanna just get you set and get this thing over with quickly for you. I am gonna put you to sleep soon with the anesthesiologist's help, Dr. Rudolph's help, but I can't put you to sleep up front. I need you awake for the very beginning. Yep. All right, okay. any questions before we get started? Okay, this is Dr. Duke Majin. I got my team here. I'll be talking to you at times. I'll be talking to my team and I'll be talking to our audience. Okay, last surgery we had 9,000 viewers. So I don't know, a lot of people at home probably not working, but I'm happy to have them as our guests watching because we're here to teach the public about back and neck problems. So that being said, we're getting started. Remember, if you feel discomfort, say ouch, but don't move. And I'm gonna put you to sleep in about five minutes, okay? All right, here we go. Just let me know if it's uncomfortable. Okay, you're doing great by the way. I'll let you know if we have any problems. I don't expect to. Sean? So the shot is lateral, the shot is an x-ray picture. What you're seeing, folks, on your screen is, a, is an x-ray picture. And x-rays have been around for hundreds of years. We've been using them to look at bones and joints for years and years. And the machines these days, this one is the top of the line, floral machine, the best, in the, the very best in the whole world. It's called the Siemens. Kind of a funny name. I didn't make it up, the Germans did. The company is a German company, and they're known for producing some of the best medical equipment in the world. So I, I have this very peculiar habit, for those of you who don't know me very well, and that I truly believe the best ingredients in whatever you do give you the very best outcomes. So if you're a spine surgeon, you want the best equipment, you want the best medications, you want the best staff, you want the best facility and you want the best skills 
okay? And if you have all those things, you're going to get the best results. I know it's a simplistic way of looking at the world, but I truly believe that it is the case 99% of the time. So if you have the best ingredients, the best equipment, the best medications, the best staff, you're going to get the best results. All right, the best results you can possibly get. Now, of course, there are doctors that have the best and they don't utilize their equipment to the full potential. Sean? Is that it? All right, very good. So we're making some progress. So take a look at the x-ray. Look at the, you can see the needle from the right side of your screen going left. And it's aiming right for the disc that we're shooting for, which is L45. Now, if you look at the two bones, you'll notice that the top bone is slipping forward on the bottom bone. It's called spondylolisthesis. Are you comfortable? All right, just relax. Everything's okay. I'll give you some more medicine. A little bit more medicine, please. Just relax. I'm giving her some, uh, yeah, Marcaine and Lidocaine. Everything's okay. Like I said, I'll, I'll take care of you. So some of you are wondering, why is our patient awake? Well, she's awake because we haven't put her to sleep yet. Why haven't we put her to sleep yet? Because I need her awake. <laughs> right? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I need her awake because I need her help. Every single patient that has this procedure, I need them awake in the very beginning. Shot? All right. So, you okay? Shot? AP? Let's see where we are. We're going to use biplanar fluoro. Bi is two in Latin. Planar, obviously, is two planes. When we speak about taking an x-ray picture, the x-ray picture is taken in a plane. It is directional. It's a vector. It's a directional vector. Good. Lateral. So this patient has a listhesis, but more importantly, she has a tear in the back of her disc on the right side at L45. That tear has allowed a herniation to come out. The herniation is pushed through the tear in the back of the disc. That tear is what's causing, and the herniation are what are causing her back and leg pain. And it's our goal to fix that today. Sean? Now, if I did a traditional surgery, she would be getting a fusion. She doesn't want a fusion. I don't blame her. Um, fusions are painful. And right now, you've got COVID-19 all over the place, especially hospitals. So we do fusions here at the surgery center, but a fusion is still a very painful, you know, long recovery. Please don't shake the machine. All right, looking good. Let's get an AP again. So we use biplanar fluoro, which means lateral and AP, and you can also do oblique views, to look at the spine front back and from sideways. So sideways and front back. So AP is front back. Perfect. Go back to a lateral. Lateral is sideways. Most of what I do is through a lateral view, but you must use the AP as well to make sure that your, your needle is not in the wrong place. So I know I make it look easy, but please don't try this at home. We're a little bit low in the foramen, but that's exactly where I want to be. I like being low in the foramen. It's a safe zone. That's where the nerve is not. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying to you? Yes? Good. Sean? So I'm feeling pretty good about this. You're doing a great job, by the way. You are. You're doing fantastic. You're making this look easy. Right? Jordan? Jordan's saying, come on, Dr. Duke, we know nothing's easy. Especially not your job, right, Jordan? But... When things go well, we can have fun. We can relax. I was talking to my team earlier today, and I was saying what surgeons, good surgeons, good, good surgeons, do the surgery pretty much the same way every time. And when you do that, you get the same result. Are you comfortable? Now, if your results are horrible, you don't want to do the surgery the same way every time. You want to find something to change and make it better. 
But once you've perfected something where you have literally the very best results you can possibly get, then you want to do it the same way. It's like making a, a cake, you know? When you find exactly the right amount of ingredients, the right type of ingredients, you bake it exactly the right way with the right oven and the right convection, whatever, or non-convection, then you want to reproduce that every single time. All right. Are you comfortable? Okay. How much of your problem is back pain versus leg? 50-50, 70-30? Seventy thirty? What'd she say? Seventy thirty. What's seventy? Your leg or your back? All right. Okay. How bad is that on a scale of one to ten? What's the highest? Give me the highest. What what's the highest number it went to? 12? All right, was that where you typically get your back pain? I have some good news for you. We found the source of your back pain. And you're making Dr. Rudolph a believer. You see, a lot of doctors and people don't believe discograms can tell you where people's pain comes from. But if you do it right, you can get a lot of valuable information. You know, the MRIs and X-rays and CAT scans and nerve tests, none of them tell you where someone's back pain comes from. But a good discogram does. You get to go to sleep, and when you wake up, we'll be done. Can you count from 1 to 100 out loud so we can all hear? And count slow. Why do I want her to count slow? Right, I don't pay the anesthesiologist if she makes it to 100. No, the reason you want them to count slow is you don't want them to hyperventilate, right? You want them to breathe slow and deep. and You're doing great. Keep counting. All right, folks. So we did a discogram. We did a, a – uh, did you get an AP yet? Do your AP while we're talking. Sorry, I've got allergies, so my nose is stuffy. But um, we did the discogram. The discogram – here's the thing. I'm going to tell you all a little secret, Okay. I'm going to give you an example so you can all understand. I'm going to teach you how insurance companies work and how they, how they prevent you from getting the medically necessary care you need to get better. It's a new strategy they've developed over the last 15 years because they've been using strategies now for the last 100 years. Keep counting out loud. Here's, here's how it works. If you have a brain tumor that's going to kill you, what do you do to treat it? Well, I'm going to use a brain tumor because for most people it's pretty obvious what you have to do. you got to take it out. A brain tumor is a mass inside your brain that's growing. And to simplify things, let's just say this is one that needs to be taken out because there are some that we radiate and some that we embolize, and some that we treat with chemotherapy. But this is the brain tumor that has to come out to save your life. Otherwise, you're going to die. Okay? This is what the insurance companies are doing. They're saying, don't do the diagnostic test, doctor, to make the diagnosis that results in a surgery. In other words, they're saying, if you have back pain, don't get an MRI. Because the MRI isn't going to help. That's like saying if you have a brain tumor, don't get an MRI of your brain because the MRI is not going to help. The MRI is pretty much the only way to make the diagnosis. Okay, Sure, you could do the old-fashioned way with cerebral angiograms, but that's ridiculous. So what they're doing is they're blocking the authorization of diagnostic tests that will show the things that need to be treated surgically. By doing that, not only do they block the cost of the diagnostic test, they also put it on you, by the way, through your deductible, but they also prevent us from finding what's causing your back pain. How convenient, right? Because if we can't see what's causing your back pain, we can't fix it with surgery. Now, not all back pain needs to be fixed with surgery, but when you have a herniated disc like hers that's causing her back pain, it has to be fixed with surgery. 
and the only surgery in the world that works is this surgery, the Duke laser disc repair, or a fusion. Now, my success rate of eliminating this back pain with a fusion is equal to the Duke laser disc repair that you're about to watch. The difference is a spinal fusion pain from the recovery, the duration of the recovery is long and it's very painful and it's more risky. So instead, I'm going to fix her disc with a laser done with a seven millimeter incision and she doesn't need to have a fusion. Now, every other surgeon out there will do a fusion on her, right? Because she has a spondylolisthesis grade one. They call that, they call that instability, but that's not the real definition of instability. The real definition of spinal instability is far broader than a listhesis. So again, the insurance companies over the years have redefined what we call s spinal instability. They've created their own definition. And that definition is something that is rarely seen structurally, which is a listhesis. Most patients with ba back pain that comes from a bad disc don't have a listhesis. So by saying that you can only have back surgery for back pain when there's a listhesis, they've eliminated 95% of patients that need back surgery to fix their back pain, but that don't have a listhesis. You see how tricky is that? How cunning and sneaky? It's basically lies, deceit, smoke and mirrors. The insurance companies make money when you don't get medical care, period. So how do you think they're doing right now? Pretty darn good. Think about it. They don't cover COVID-19. Hmm? The government is, the taxpayers will, but they're holding their bills. They're not charging for treating patients with COVID-19 because probably because the insurance companies don't want to pay for it. But they're also getting a free pass because all the elective surgeries that are normally done in a month, probably at least $50 billion worth of elective surgery every month, that's been on hold. So you can just add another $100 billion to the insurance company's bottom line this year. But I guarantee you, you won't see it in their profits that they announce every year. You know why? Because they hide it. They take that money and they send it overseas. Offshore accounts, Turks and Caicos, right? Grand Turk. Anyway, that's a very simplistic way of saying it, but basically they divert the profits to what are called subsidiary companies that are not regulated by our government. Because remember Obama passed a PPACA plan that put a limitation on how much profit the insurance companies can make, but they've just gone around that by basically creating subsidiary companies that are service companies to the insurance company. For example, a janitor service company that cleans their building and that's not regulated by the government in terms of profit. So they're still making all the profits, they're just doing it in a roundabout way. And those profits they're taking out of our healthcare system are in the hundreds of billions. But for purposes of stock owners, public stockholders like United Healthcare, Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna, Aetna, all the profits they report on the stock exchange are the profits they want you to see. But multiply that times about 10 and you get their real profit margins. <coughs> Will you see a bump in your profits this quarter for the COVID-19 with all the elective surgeries, 95% of surgery on hold? You should, and what if you don't? What if you don't see a massive bump in your profit? Would that surprise you? It should surprise you. Let's see what happens. Hmm? I don't think they're gonna share this profit with the stockholders. I think they're gonna divert it because they are greedy pigs. Satan's lap child. And they have no intention of sharing their profits with you. Only as little as they can get away with. As little as they can report to the government as being profit. They cook the books and hide the rest of it. So, if you're a stockholder in a public traded company that's in healthcare stock, don't expect to see too much of an improvement in your profitability, but you should see a massive doubling or tripling of the profits. But you won't, because they're gonna divert most of that overseas. Shot. 
How do I know so much? How do I know so much, Luis? Huh? No. Not because I'm a smart guy. I'm not smarter than anybody else. I know so much because I give a damn. Because I'm tired of seeing people not get health care that they need because the insurance companies are keeping the damn money. So when I see people not getting their health care they need because the insurance companies are denying the services, I ask myself, why would they deny the services? I mean, these are medically necessary things. And where is all that money going that they're getting from premiums and copays? Well, they don't get the copay money, but that gives them a break. They don't have to pay the copay money. They make you pay it, the patient. They've raised deductibles, they've raised copay, so you're paying more of the doctor's bill. We're not getting more money, by the way. Every year your copay and deductible has gone up. We've been getting cut five to 10% a year as providers. And I'm talking hospitals, doctors, therapists, you name it. We've all seen cuts every single year, year after year. Meanwhile, you, the patient, are paying a higher premium or your employer is. Every single year, your premiums are going up eight to 10%. We're losing 8 to 10% a year. Today, I make literally one quarter of what I made 15 years ago when I started. One quarter. So, and I know all my colleagues are the same way. Their revenue is down. That's why they're all going out of business, by the way, in case you were wondering why they're closing their offices or selling to the hospital. They're selling because they're not making enough money to cover their overhead. Anesthesiologists are no exception. All the anesthesia groups have gone out of business. All the little groups of one, two, three, ten anesthesiologists. Now they're being, huh? They've all sold out because they can't afford to stay in business. Let me give you an example of what an anesthesiologist gets paid. An anesthesiologist should make about $400 an hour, in my opinion. 400 bucks an hour would be very fair for the amount of work and training they do. Medicare pays them $90 an hour, nine zero, 90. And companies like Blue Cross Blue Shield will pay even less than Medicare. So how can you survive as a doctor, as an anesthesiologist getting paid $90 an hour? You can't, you can't. And that's when you get paid by the way, which a lot of the times the insurance companies don't even pay the bill. They just <laughs> throw it in the garbage and they make you, the doctor, have to resend another bill. And they don't tell you they throw it in the garbage, by the way. Am I making this up? Absolutely not. We have people who used to work for the insurance companies as billers, I mean, as, as claim processors. And they work for us as billers. And they tell us the stories about how their supervisor would come in and tell them, uh, here's your stack of claims you have to work today. And they would give them a stack of claims that would take literally 25, 30 hours to work, and they say, you've got eight hours to work these claims, and don't rush. Take your time and take lots of breaks. And at the end of the day, whatever claims you haven't worked to pay for the doctors, whatever doctor bills you haven't paid, you just throw them in the garbage can. Throw them in the garbage can. So guess what kind of people they have working at the insurance companies after going through this? Most people would say, that's not right. These doctors did their job. They, they took care of the patient and this payment is so little already, but they want you to throw it in the garbage can. So what happens when you throw the doctor's bill in the garbage can? Well, first of all, the doctor doesn't get paid, but more importantly for the insurance company, they get to keep the money. It's called a denial, a denial. And that's how they're making all their profits now is through denials. So what has to happen then is the doctor's office has to realize they haven't been paid. And that's not easy, believe it or not. You have to have staff going through the payments and saying, wait, we didn't get paid. And I can tell you from running a medical practice now for 16 years that having the right staff to recognize you haven't been paid, believe it or not, is really rare to find those people and it's expensive, okay? 
most billing personnel, when they're told that the uh, bill wasn't paid or they don't even know the bill wasn't paid, they have no way to look and figure it out. For the ones that do, though, they call the insurance company. The insurance company says, we paid properly, which, of course, they didn't pay a single dime. But if you fight them, and you have to fight them, believe me, you have to get documentation, paperwork, it takes time and money, you have to resubmit the claim. And then sometimes they'll just throw that away too. It'll take you six months to get $100. And you've got to spend quite literally twice that amount to get that $100 from the insurance company. See, people don't know about this, but it's destroying medicine. So if you say, I don't care, Dr. Duke Majin, it doesn't bother me, it doesn't affect me, I've got great insurance, you don't have great insurance. I can tell you that right now. You don't. Your insurance company, if you look at what your doctor charges and what they've paid, you're going to see there's a big difference. And they, insurance companies hide it from you. When they send you your EOB or explanation of benefit, they'll actually lie. They'll say to you in your explanation of benefit, the doctor's bill was $1,000. Blue Cross Blue Shield took care of $950. Well, notice the word they choose. It's not we paid $950, you pay $50. They said we took care of or we negotiated or we managed or, you know, basically it's their way of saying, we stole the doctor's lunch money, but we did it because we have a contract. And we screwed the doctor, but we did it legally because we have a contract. We just didn't pay him. They call that a write-off or a write-down. They call it a contractual reduction of what they pay the doctor. And they are sneaky because they don't tell you straight up. Sometimes they do. Some insurance companies will still show you a statement where they show what they actually paid. But a lot of them just show what, what your responsibility is and what they, the amount that they've negotiated off. And believe it or not, a lot of doctors only get what the patient pays, which is not enough to survive on. So if you don't believe me, that's fine. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm just telling you the God's honest truth. I've been doing this for years. Just so you know my qualifications, I was the chief of staff at the hospital for two years. That's the highest position as a doctor can hold besides being a board member. But I meet with the board every week and I go over all the financials. I was also the president of the Brevard County Medical Society. The most in no doctor usually is the president of the medical society for an entire county. That's what I was. And before that I was a, the vice president, before that I was the secretary and treasurer. So. I've had many years in administration and management and leadership and medical practices. On top of that, I'm the CEO and founder of Duke Spine Institute. So I had to start from scratch. Literally one employee besides myself back in 2004 and I had to learn how to run a business, a medical practice since then. Now I haven't sold out to the hospital or to the insurance company. We're still here so I've been pretty good about running our business, so I know a lot about billing and collection. You know, taking care of patients is easy. The problem is if you don't have the money, if you're not getting paid the money, you can't take care of patients. So <laughs> the insurance companies are perfectly happy to have doctors take care of the patients and not pay them. It's a really screwed up system. Where else in the world do you get paid months and months after you've provided service? Never. I mean, imagine if you had an air conditioning guy that came over and said, let me fix your air conditioner, but don't worry about paying me for six months. And I'll just take whatever you send. Huh? How many people have an air conditioned person like that? If you do, tell me. I want the name and phone number. <laughs> I need that person. How many of you have had a plumber that says, listen, you don't need to pay me. Just... When you get around to paying me in six months or so, just send me whatever you want to send me. That's what the insurance companies do to doctors and hospitals. Okay? They t drag their feet to pay. They make us jump through all kinds of hoops for one purpose, to not pay. They're looking for any excuse not to pay. Now, Medicare. Medicare is run by private insurance companies. 
but they're like a wolf in sheep's clothes. They're not going to tell you, hey, I'm Blue Cross Blue Shield. They call themselves things like First Coast Services. Okay? First Coast Services. Who would ever think that that's Blue Cross Blue Shield? I wouldn't. But I know it is. I know it's a subsidiary of Blue Cross Blue Shield. And they basically administer Medicare benefits for all Medicare patients in the state of Florida, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and one more. I can't remember where it is. but So this Blue Cross Blue Shield company has basically made a deal with Medicare and said, listen, we're going to save you money by not paying the doctors. Are you okay with that? And they said, sure, as long as our name isn't, you know, we're not the ones that are held responsible. You guys are. Do whatever you got to do. Knock yourself out. Abuse the hospitals and doctors and therapists. Abuse them all. Don't pay them. We don't care. You know, we ju we'll just say we hired you guys to manage the benefits. So Medicare gets to wash their hands because they've hired their MAC or Medicare administrator and the Medicare administrator is the one not paying the doctors. All right. If you have questions about insurance, I'll do my best to answer them. I'm happy to talk about them, but for right now, I'll tell you what we're doing here. We're looking down a metal tube. This is like a straw, and we're at the from the inside of the straw, and we're at the bottom right where the tip of the straw is, which happens to be inside the herniation. This is all herniation right here. The blue fiber is the laser. It's a homium YAG laser fiber. The laser beam is a homium YAG laser beam. Homium YAG. What does YAG stand for? Yttrium, argon, and garnet. Okay? YAG stands for yttrium, argon, and garnet. They're basically chemical elements that produce, when energized, they produce a laser beam, a beam of energy that is so powerful and beautiful that we use it in medicine. It's very nice. It gets very hot. And the water I use is cold. Otherwise, it would be causing fires down there. All that jiggly, jiggly stuff that you see going on is a combination of the movement of the irrigation, which is saline solution going down the tube and out, and the um, wave energy of the energy pulse. It's like a shock wave. Every time the laser bursts, boom, 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 boom. It's like a shock wave, like a pulse of energy and it's shaking everything around. And I actually use that shaking energy. It's really a sound wave, for those of you who want to know. It's a sound wave in the water, and it shakes the, the disc herniations loose once they've been freed up by the uh, thermal energy. We call this vaporization. The thermal energy is vaporization, and the sound energy the sound wave or shock wave is a shock wave, basically. So we've got thermal energy or heat energy. It's called vaporization. And we've got a shock wave. Those two things are what allow this surgery, the laser, to do its job properly inside the disc. All right, so we are looking at the disc from the side. Here's the back of the disc, and the front of the disc is more down here. These, this is the vertebral body or a bone above the disc. Here's the bone below the disc over there. This is at 12 o'clock is like the, the back of the disc where the herniation is, okay? Now, this patient doesn't just have a herniation. She has a slippage, too. I'm not fixing the slippage. The only way to fix a slippage is with a fusion, okay? We're not doing a fusion. She didn't want one. And I don't blame her. I wouldn't do it either. If I could have the Duke laser disc repair, I would do the Duke laser disc repair, not the fusion. Now, the nerve root is right just up there on the other side of that blue. If you go, like, to 12 o'clock, the nerves are just, just on the other side of that membrane. But right here is the actual herniation. I'm in the herniation, vaporizing it. Isn't that beautiful? All this done with a 7-millimeter incision and a recovery of one hour. Tomorrow, she'll be back on her feet, living life pretty much normal. If you had a fusion, you'd be down for about a month. So this woman is choosing to do things with state-of-the-art Duke laser disc repair and avoid being down for a month after surgery. Okay? People have a choice. So do you. You don't have to do nothing. 
and live with your pain. You don't have to do what your insurance company tells you and live with your pain. You can get it fixed. But it's your choice. And by the way, the insurance companies are going to keep not paying for all your medical care as long as you let them not pay. Huh. So who do you have to blame? You can't blame the insurance companies. You've got to blame yourself for not doing anything about it. Let me tell you my first time I ever learned about just how evil insurance companies are. I was a, an undergraduate student at University of California, San Diego, UCSD, one of the top UC schools in California. I was valedictorian in my high school class. I got into UCSD. I was very happy. It was my dream school. I went to UCSD and I loved it. Okay, but I figured out after I graduated, I went to med school at USC in Los Angeles, University of Southern California, right? And I'm in USC. I finished my first year of med school, and I'm pretty much valedictorian for the first year, highest grades. But I also figured out I wanted to be a, a neurosurgeon, brain surgeon. By the way, I didn't know that brain surgeons did spine surgery back then. I got five minutes or less, okay, doctor? Five minutes. So... I do neuroanatomy the first year, and I fall in love with the nervous system during the at the end of the first year of med school. Now, you have a break between the first and second year of med school, summer break. It's the only time you get a break. So everyone says, oh, you ought to do research. You ought to do research during the summer. Don't waste your summer. Do research if you want to be successful and get into a good neurosurgery program. So I did research at UCSD. See, I had a girlfriend at the time. Sorry, guys. And um, my girlfriend was in San Diego. So I got a job in a lab with a neurosurgeon. His name was Lou Kornakia. And Lou is a neurosurgery, neurosurgeon resident training there. Now, the chairman of neurosurgery is a guy named Tom Marshall. And Dr. Marshall was the chairman of neurosurgery, but he was also the head, like, the medical director for their insurance company, for Kaiser, I think it was. So he made decisions about whether or not people got medical care. So one day I go to the lab to w work with Dr. Kornakia, who was my boss, and, he, and I, he was really unhappy. And I said, what's wrong, Lou? And he said, I just heard that my best friend, who's a neurosurgery resident here, his wife has lymphoma. She's going to die unless she gets a bone marrow transplant. And it was just denied. So she's going to die. And I said, well, why did they deny it? And he said, it was denied because they said with the bone marrow transplant, she only had about a 25% chance of surviving and making it through. And I said, well, it's pretty obvious to me that 25% is a lot better than 0%. So why don't they approve it? And he said, the person who denied it was Dr. Marshall, the chairman of neurosurgery. And I said, how could the chairman of neurosurgery deny a cancer treatment for a bone marrow? It has nothing to do with neurosurgery. He said, well, he's, he's the person who makes decisions like that for the health plan. I said, so you're telling me an insurance company can deny somebody a life-saving procedure? And he said, yes. And I said, why would he do that? And he says, because the chance of it working is not very high. It's only 25%. I said, that's crazy. It's just money. And he said, yeah. So that was my first experience with insurance companies denying life-sustaining or life-saving medical care. And I had no idea that that e thing even existed. Of course, now I'm, what? How old was I back then? I don't remember now. It's been so long ago. Uh, it's about 30 years ago, maybe give or take a few years. Now I know, 30 years later, exactly what he was talking about. Those denials don't just happen once in a blue moon. They happen on a daily basis. All right, the nerve is in that fat right there in the foramen. The herniation is pretty much gone. Let me see the laser. I'm going to do a little bit more. What you're seeing at 12 o'clock, that yellow kind of shiny stuff, that's fat. We call it adipose tissue, just, just to be nice. But that's fat. Those are fat cells. There's a few veins in there, too. 
but right now I'm in the her where the herniation was. So I've done just about everything I can do with the laser here, and I'm feeling like I'm pretty happy with what I'm seeing here. I don't know if it's going to work. I believe it is, but we'll find out soon. What I do know is that she's avoided a major surgery with screws and rods, most likely. We didn't do that today, and I think this is going to work for her. I've done about 100 of these surgeries on spondylolisthesis patients, and I'll be honest with you, the patients with spondylolisthesis do just as well with this Duke laser disc repair as the ones without spondylolisthesis. In other words, the spondylolisthesis doesn't matter. The surgery still works. You don't need a fusion. You can do this procedure, Duke laser disc repair, which is an annular debridement combined with a discectomy in order to fix the problem. All right, that looks good to me. Good job, everybody. I'll take questions if you have any. Go ahead and type your questions up. I am going to head over to the conference room in a little bit, and we're going to answer your questions, okay? Let's show them the incision. See there? Let's show them the incision, Sean. All right, okay. we can see it. All right, put some pressure. Okay, everyone, I'm Dr. Duke Majin. Can you see me? Can you see me? Yes, we can. All right. I'm actually a surgeon, not a conductor. I know this looks like my conductor baton, but it's not. This is the endoscopic tube. The whole surgery was done through this tube. Can you see that thing? Okay. You might think it was a milkshake straw, but it's not. I just put it right through into the disc, and I do the entire surgery through that tiny little tube. That's why the incision is only seven millimeters. You guys see that incision right there? Seven millimeters, okay? So this is Band-Aid surgery at its finest for the spine. The whole surgery was done through the little tube. I didn't have to damage anything except for the skin. We cut the skin open. Other than that, we pushed the muscles open and we went into the disc and fixed the disc directly without taking any bone out of the patient's spine. Every other surgery that's done, traditional surgeries have to take bone out. And now she's already got some instability that's seen with the bone slipping. If you start drilling bone out in the back of the spine to do a microdiscectomy or a laminectomy, you're gonna have to fuse. Otherwise, the spine will just fall apart. So this surgery, the Duke Laser Disc Repair, allows us, by coming from the side and going towards the middle, allows me to fix the disc without taking any bone from the back of the spine out. Great job, hopefully you enjoyed. I'm gonna come answer questions. So start typing your questions up. I'll be happy to answer them for you.
All right, Dr. Duke Majin, back with you. I was just checking on our post-op patient. That's the one who had the surgery before this lady. For those of you who watched the first surgery be done, not the one we canceled, the, I guess it would be second surgery, but the first one that was actually completed is the one before this one. She had two levels done, L45, L5S1. She came to me with a drop foot and numbness in her leg on the right side and a drop foot. Drop foot means patients have trouble cocking their foot up. In other words, they're walking along and instead of picking their foot up to take a step, they actually drag it because they don't have the strength in the muscle. The muscle specifically is called the tibialis anterior and that muscle cannot cock the foot up. Um, the other is the extensor hallucis longus. It's a muscle that goes to the toe. The, they're innervated by L4 and L5 pretty much, which are the nerve roots that we worked on today. Anyway, I just saw the patient. She's ready to go home. She's happy, smiling. Um, she has normal strength now. So we basically gave her back her strength. Uh, she still has numbness. Her foot's still a bit numb. It hasn't changed. Um, but I'll tell you right now, the numbness usually takes uh, three to six months, sometimes even a little bit longer than six months. But I always tell people three to six months for the numbness to come back. That's from the nerve being pinched so hard. So her nerve will come back, her strength, will, I mean, her numbness will come back, her sensory will come back, and her strength is already back. So I'm really happy about that. She's smiling. The other thing is um, she has no back pain. So the sur pre-surgical back pain, the back pain she had at L4, 5, L5, S1, which is where the herniations were, gone, 100%. And she has some pain where I cut her and I put the tube in, but aside from that, she's, she's doing fantastic. She's on her way home. We were having a little chuckle back there because I ride horses, she rides horses. And I went to Mexico about a month ago. I was riding with my wife and kids in uh, Cabo, San Lucas. And um, for the first time ever, I got on a horse and I rode it. And about, about an hour later, oh my God, my hips were killing me. I it was in so much pain. And every time the horse took a, a step, I was just in agonizing hip pain. And I remember thinking to myself, this saddle um, feels like it's pushing me forward, like down towards the, sh the horse's shoulders. And I just could not, like, sit properly on it. And I thought to myself, this saddle is probably the problem because I've ridden horses over 100 times, and uh, I've never had that problem before. So I thought either I'm getting old and my hips are hurting me or there's something wrong with the saddle. Well, it turned out that there was something wrong with the saddle. So she was giving me some advice on which saddle to, to make sure I use next time, a balanced saddle. So anyway, we were kind of chuckling about that. But I understand that we do have a question from the audience. So I'm going to hand this back to Sean. He's going to pose the question to me. I'll answer it. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to type them up. If you have comments, feel free to type them up. Again, I'm Dr. Arjig Majan. I'm the CEO and founder of Duke Spine Institute. It is April 1st, 2020. And I uh, appreciate the fact none of you are cracking any April Fool's jokes. It's a pretty serious time right now across the world with this coronavirus outbreak that's going on. And I hope everyone that you know and care about is safe and um, remains that way. Okay? So here's Sean with, this, with the question. All right, our first question comes from a viewer who asks, Do you recommend any specific sleeping position for patients who just got out of surgery? My friends recommended that I get a recliner and sleep in it because it's better on your back than laying flat on a bed. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, um, thank you for asking the question. It's a really good question. So one of our um, viewers has had back surgery and the, was asking about what's the best way to lay in bed. Well, that's a great question. So here's, here's the first thing I'm thinking about is your incision. Where did they cut you? Did they cut you in the middle of your back? And did they cut you on the flank? Did they cut you in your belly? Um, where they went into your body to get to your spine matters. If uh, you have an incision in your lower back that's in the middle of your back, then it's really best not to lay on your incision. You have to stay off of it. What I tell all my patients that have incisions straight down the middle of their back is do not lay on it at home. 
go home and keep it up in the air. And the way you do that is you kind of lay to your side and you have someone put a pillow under your shoulders and put a second pillow under your buttocks or hips. That way you stay kind of cantered off to the one side. Then you can rotate every couple of hours side to side. All right, but do not put pressure on your incision. If you've just had surgery and you have a surgical incision, don't lay on it, don't put pressure on it. See, the thing about pressure is that it pushes the blood away from that area of your body that you have pressure on it. That's why people get bed sores. Maybe you've seen somebody with a bed sore. It's a part of the body where they laid on that skin for too long and that has caused the skin and the muscle on that spot to die because it didn't get enough blood flow. If you take blood flow away from your body organs, you're going to die. That body organ is going to die. You take blood flow away from the brain for five minutes, it's dead. You got a stroke. You take blood flow away from the heart for five minutes, boom, heart attack. You take blood flow away from the kidney for about 10 minutes, your kidney's going to, part of your kidney is going to die, okay? It's called a renal infarct. So every, di every single tissue in your body has a different need for perfusion. The retina, five minutes, gone. So the tissues in your body that are the ones that need blood flow the most and cannot go without blood flow, and have to, if you're going to take blood flow, it has to be the shortest amount of time, like five minutes, is your retina, your brain, and your um, heart. Then there's the kidney shortly after that. But by the time you get to the skin and muscles, you can go for about two to three hours, no blood flow to the skin and muscle before it dies. Once it dies, you'll have a hole in your skin, big ulcer, and your muscle too. So long story short, if you have an in surgical incision, I would say stay off it for the first week. You know, So what's best? Recliner. Recliner's okay, but even better would be to lay in bed and have a pillow under your shoulder and your buttock. And just keep that incision up in the air so it stays dry. If it stays dry, chances are it won't get infected. If it, if it gets down in your sheets and it gets wet and gooey with sweat, it's probably going to get infected because that's where bacteria like to live. So keep it up in the air and dry and keep your pressure off of it. That's the best advice I can give you. If you want to put a pillow between your knees, that's good. Put, put a pillow uh, underneath the knees to keep them bent. Hips flexed, that's probably good too. But the most important thing is don't let it get hot and sweaty and gooey. And then don't lay on it. All right? That's my best advice. Well, I hope you have enjoyed the surgery and the question and answer session. Again, I'm Dr. Aru Duke Majin. I've got Sean here with me. He's with Patient Services. Duke Spine Institute has an app. We're one of the only spine centers in the world with our own app, and it's a really good app. You can get it on your iPhone or on your Android phone, and it's free. We don't charge for it. You can download it free. We don't do any advertising on it. We don't, like, sell your app to somebody else who pays us money. It's just honestly there um, to help you, the person suffering with back and neck pain, so you have information at your fingertips, specifically you can learn about different spine conditions. And um, you can access uh, our patient services. You can submit your MRI for a free review through the app. Again, it's the Duke Spine Institute. Just type it in, D-E-U-K Spine Institute app. Um, also, Duke Spine Institute has a Facebook group. It's called Spine Surgery Support Group. If you go to the Spine Surgery Support Group in Facebook and you apply for membership, I'll let you in. The main thing is we're really not a marketing and advertising Facebook group. We're there to um, share information, questions, and answers. Um, we have surgeons like me, the founder of Duke Spine, answering questions. Uh, I don't answer every question, but I try to get as many as I can. Dr. Patel, my partner, who is very experienced in interventional pain management, he answers questions. Sean sitting next to me answers questions. So we have a bunch of people on the team that answer questions, plus the group members answer questions. So people are allowed to pose questions and, and get answers from the group. We share information. Uh, we don't tolerate any rude behavior from anyone. Um, we don't tolerate you know, nonsense. It's basically considered 
a place where people can come to learn. Uh, we'll do our best to teach, and it's a great environment, uh, community to be part of if you're a Facebook person. So spine surgery support group, free, and um, it does require you apply, and we accept you. And if you have something to post, obviously we have to approve it, but uh, we're just trying to keep it free of advertisement and, and basically free of people making um, uh, false news, for lack of a better term. All right, hope you enjoyed the surgery. Like I said, the last patient we did is already on her way home. Her back pain is gone. She said she would be in tomorrow around 9.30 Eastern time. So East Coast time, 9.30, we'll probably be doing a, a video of her reco recovering. And um, hopefully we can share that with you tomorrow. So look for that post. And hopefully the lady we just finished with will also be doing well. And we can post her video as well. Um, and we got one more surgery to go. Thanks.